Good evening. Welcome to UT Brainstorms. My name is Mike Mock. I'm a professor in the Department of Neuroscience and I'll serve as tonight's moderator for uh, UT Brainstorms number 27. So there are many people to thank. Tonight, I'd like to focus on the two most important, really, uh, Laura and Ian and Elena Silva, who are two of the people who keep the Department of Neuroscience running and certainly the two people who put in the most effort to make this work and who have set up th this connection between Zoom and YouTube Live so that we can continue doing this. So thank you to Laura and Elena, as always. Brainstorms was created by the Department of uh, Neuroscience as a way to connect UT scientists with their uh, friends in the, in the Austin community uh, so that we can share our knowledge and passion for science and you can share with us uh, how it matters to you and what you most wanna learn from us. Uh, so this is our third season. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, as we say, we'll keep doing this as long as people keep showing up. Uh, this is Brainstorms number 27, and it's our second one in, in this uh, virtual uh, YouTube live uh, format. Um, we're working on more. There's more in the works. You'll, you'll hear about uh, the next one uh, tonight. Uh, the, the fall season will be in this format, uh, obviously, and so uh, look for more on the way. So this third season has held many firsts. If you think all the way back to September and October, the first two brainstorms where we had faculty members from outside of UT Austin, a couple of friends of mine, one from Johns Hopkins, one from uh, UT San Antonio. Uh, we had our first cancellation in April uh, due to the, corona, the, the growing coronavirus problem. We had uh, just uh, last uh, May our, our, our first uh, Zoom YouTube brainstorms uh, by Michael Drew, which uh, was a great success. And so tonight uh, is another first. It's, a, it's something that we've been discussing and talking about for a while, which is how to expand brainstorms to include uh, uh, topics uh, beyond neuroscience. And we've wondered how to do this in a way that maintain the, the brainstorms feel, uh, but, to, but to move outside of neuroscience. And so for all the bad that the coronavirus has produced, it, to, it presents an obvious first step in, in this uh, regard, which is uh, to invite some of our molecular biology friends to talk about vaccine development in the coronavirus which is uh, tonight's topic. Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, uh, Dr. Dan Leahy, who's the professor and chair of the Department of Molecular Biosciences. And before we turn it over to Dan, let me just remind you that Dan's gonna give a presentation. Uh, and then at the end of that, uh, he'll introduce three of his colleagues from Molecular Biosciences who will serve as tonight's panel. You can type in your questions in the YouTube chat and we'll select the questions and uh, the panel will do their best to answer them. Uh, as always, if you don't uh, get your question answered tonight, email it to me, mock at utexas.edu, and I'll do my best to either answer it or quite likely in this case, uh, forward it to somebody who can. So uh, tonight's speaker, Dan Leahy, as I said, is, is the chair of the Department of Biosciences. Uh, he's a brilliant scientist. Uh, he's a friend and a, a confidant. Uh, I've learned a lot from him, uh, mentored with him about how to be a better chair. Uh, and uh, he has kindly agreed to, to take this big first step and be the first non-neuroscientist to present at UT Brainstorm. So uh, without any further ado, uh, please uh, virtually, I guess, welcome uh, Dr. Dan Leahy. All right, well, thanks, Mike. So I have a, two things I wanna say let, at the beginning. One is, although the title is COVID on the brain and it's in the brainstorms, as Mike hinted, this is a, a figurative, not literal COVID on the brain. So I'm, although there are neurological effects and probably very interesting, I'm not gonna talk about them. I'm gonna talk about basically what we've all been thinking about for the last six months, because we had a lot of time to do so, is sort of what is COVID and what are we gonna do about it? And I really took the approach since the second caveat is that 
I'm neither a virologist or an epidemiologist, although it seems I sometimes play when on Zoom. Now, before you start streaming for the exits and demanding your money back, let me just tell you what Mike told me when I made that point to him. He said, you'll be perfect. You won't be able to confuse anyone with jargon. And so hopefully that will set the tone for where we're gonna to go today. And I've been liberally soliciting questions from friends and family and as well as my own, and really looked forward to this as an opportunity to um, sort of answer those nagging questions or see what I can find out about certain things that I think we're all wondering about. So just a little bit of uh, outline here. I'm gonna start with a brief history of vaccinations. Where did it come from? How, how do we do it? I'm gonna talk about some key properties of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So I'll point this out later, but the virus's name is SARS-CoV-2. The disease it causes is COVID-19. It has some special properties that really make it a very, very bad actor in terms of a pandemic and how we might respond to it. And then I'm going to round up, hopefully on a, oops, on a little more hopeful note about where we are and what we can possibly do. And I would like to add, as Mike pointed out, that although I am not a virologist or an epidemiologist, I'm backed up by three superb panelists who will um, be able to hopefully politely correct me if I'm wrong and answer very authoritatively any questions that you may have. So, um, it turns out that pandemics are not a new thing. I mean, in our lifetime, we've had the AIDS pandemic. Our grandparents had the, the 1918 Spanish flu. And in between, there have been various flu outbreaks and Ebola outbreaks and so on. But that's really been the condition of humankind for a long time, and it's really shaped our affairs. And in fact, if you just go to Google and type in plague art, you get a lot of um, options. And this particular uh, painting was from the 17th century Holland by Michael Swartz. It's in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art titled Plague of an Ancient City. And it's believed to represent the plague of Athens, which happened in 430 BC, I guess it's BCE now. And is well described actually in the Thucydides, the uh, Peloponnesian War. And um, so it's well described because the Thucydides himself was a victim of the plague and so he survived it. And uh, he left a very, very good description of it that to this day has left their medical conferences debating what the possible causative agent of that plague was. But it profoundly affected Athens. It had 75,000 to 100,000 deaths and it, including Pericles, their leader, and is generally thought to have contributed to their ultimate downfall and loss in their war, Peloponnesian War to the Spartans. Now, if you go to the Wikipedia page for the Plague of Athens, so this is a very busy slide, but the point is that it's a very busy slide. There have been a lot of plagues and a lot of epidemics and a lot of pandemics that, you know, enough that merit their own Wikipedia page. So this is indeed not new. And in fact, it's touched on most of our culture. And I had a little bit of um, amusement I'm thinking about by coming across this article in the Manchester Guardian from 2015, basically pointing out that in the year 1606, Shakespeare's Globe Theater Company had to shut down because of recurrence of the plague. And so let's see if you can see my cursor here. I have uh, I've sort of highlighted in yellow that um, the point that two years earlier in London, there was an outbreak in which more than 30,000 Londoners died. So now at the time, the population of London was about 200,000. So that would be equivalent in Austin of about 150,000 deaths. And so the Privy Council decreed that the public plague should cease once the number of those who died every week of the plague rose above the number of 30. So that actually is kind of reminiscent about the current times in Austin, where we have a number and a target of hospitalizations in this case. So this is not new. Also not new is if you read further in the article, it seems like the players were really concerned about loss of business and may have actually opened up when the numbers got around 40. <laughs> so 
Another famous example that we've been hearing about, mostly just to humble us while we sit in our um, uh, homes on Zoom, Isaac Newton, as I believe a 23 year old, just freshly graduated from Cambridge um, during an outbreak of the bubonic plague 60 years later, so 1665, uh, escaped to this country house. And in that year, which um, is now called the Annus Mirabilis or the miracle year, he invented calculus, he invented optics, and he developed a theory of gra gravitation. So um, anyway, not a bad year. Um, and he also escaped the plague. So what do these stories tell us? Well, what did our ancestors learn from pandemics? Now, I I think the first thing they learned was that they could blame, basically say this was the wrath of an angry God who's upset by their political opponents. But beside that, um, people knew that pandemic diseases were contagious. They knew that if you could, you would escape to the countryside. Also from Thucydides, we know he, he, he talked about it moving from Libya through, or starting in Ethiopia, moving through Libya, through Egypt and into the, to the Middle East and on to Greece. So it was well known that it moved with people and it traveled and it was contagious. The other thing people knew was that if you survived the disease, you were generally protected from the disease. And a classic example in, of this is the Faroe Islands. So the Faroe Islands are a small group of islands about halfway between uh, Norway and Iceland in the North Atlantic. And in 1846, and they're a protectorate of the De Denmark, a Danish physician was sent to investigate a measles epidemic in 1846. And what he observed was that everybody over the age of 65 was spared the measles. And it turned out there had been a plague of an epidemic of measles on the island exactly 65 years earlier in 1781, showing that everybody who had been prior exposed and on the island virtually everyone was, um, survived so that there was immunity. Now, now we now know that measles, measles is actually one of the most um, easy to immunize against and longest lasting um, um, infectious disease for which you can get immunity so that, for example, you don't have to get a measles booster. Now, moving on, um, I think probably a strong candidate for uh, largest killer of humans in history is smallpox. The only one who might give it a run for money is tuberculosis. Now it's been around for a while. Um, I can show you in the top right here. This is a 30, whoa, two, two, 3,200 year old Egyptian mummy which is, has what appear to be the classic pox that have been interpreted as smallpox. Now, smallpox occurred in outbreaks, and it was very, very dangerous. About 30% of people who contracted the disease died. However, there are cases, for example, Native Americans, where the population was relatively naive to the, to the disease, where upwards of 50% of infected people died. Now, this final point that in the 20th century, prior to the vaccine becoming widespread, 300 million people died. Now, I thought that was a typo or a mistake because that actually represents more than twice the number of people who were killed in all of the wars in the 20th century. But in fact, if you start digging around, that is probably pretty close. Um, and we assume that um, similar numbers of people have died in prior centuries. Um, now, returning to this notion that people knew that if you survived the disease, you became immune, it turns out that in 1500 in China, um, there is a, a the first written uh, documentation of something called variolation. Now, variolation is a name we've given it later, obviously, after the variola, which is the variola virus, which causes smallpox. But, but it, although it's written first, appear, written first, first written written in 1500, it may have been uh, up to um, you know, nearly 2,000 years earlier, this practice where they would take either pus or ground up scabs from people who are infected and then inoculate people with it as a way of giving them 
a weaker form or a lower, uh, less dangerous bout of the disease that they could then survive and um, then be immune to further infection. Now this was indeed protective, but about two to 4% of the people to whom this happened died. So it was by no means benign. And in fact, you were sick for several weeks. Now this practice had moved from China to the Middle East and in fact, in early 18th century, Lady Montague, who was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey, um, herself became ill with smallpox, nearly died, survived and had very bad scarring. And she was very concerned about her young son. And she heard about this practice. And so in around 1717 or 1718, she had him inoculated and he did in fact survive and become immune. And she was so, uh, impressed that she then sent letters to a lot of um, famous physicians and her friends in England and the, and the um, um, variolation as it is moved uh, to England in the 18th century. Now it also moved to America. So in affected our revolutionary war. So in 1777, George Washington realize or it became apparent that 90% of the deaths in his army were from infectious disease, most from smallpox, not from battle. And in fact, the British, because they'd had more exposure and inoculation to smallpox were not as affected by it. And it was seriously concerning him. So that in February of 1777, he ordered his continental, the entire continental army, all those who had not had smallpox, like Washington, who'd had it as a a young man to be inoculated. And he in fact kept this information secret from the British because he worried that they would make an opportunistic surprise attack while his army was sick recovering from this inoculation. Now that proved successful. The infection rate in the um, Continental Army went from 17% to 1% and is largely credited with enabling the army to uh, be successful as it moves south and not uh, be uh, succumbing to, um, to um, smallpox. Now this smallpox inoculation moved uh, to another stage at the very end of the 18th century in 1796. This is a painting showing Dr. Edward Jenner, who was a local doctor in Gloucester, England, essentially uh, inoculating the eight-year-old son of his gardener with cowpox. So what Jenner had observed was that the local milkmaids would get cowpox, which was a mild form of the disease. They would survive. They got it from cows, hence the name cowpox. Um, but then once you survived cowpox, you were also immune to smallpox. So he had his theory that if he immunized somebody with cowpox, they would have a mild disease and yet be immune to smallpox. Now he tested this out on James Phipps, the eight-year-old son of his gardener. And then he did what is an experiment that would be very unethical today. He did what a what's called a challenge test. So after James had survived his cowpox, Dr. Jenner then gave him smallpox and he didn't ha have any problems. So he had actually survived, but had it not worked, it would be viewed as an unethical thing to give somebody a potentially lethal disease for which there was no cure um, based on your hypothesis. Um, now Jenner, uh, turns out it was a member of the Royal Society based on some work he'd done on the nesting of cuckoos, birds, not people. And uh, he submitted a paper describing this to the, Royal so to, the, um, to the Royal Society, which rejected it because they felt that it was premature and it was not well done. And so he did what we all do in science. He went back, repeated the experiment, did others, and then he wrote a, a man manuscript and historians often credit um, that experience for forcing to do um, more convincing work job. Now, uh, then is now vaccination. And he, I should say he gave it the name vaccination because vaca was Latin for cow and gives rise to our word vaquero for cowboy. And so he called it vaccination because he wanted to be very clear it was distinct from inoculation. So that the inoculation had a, you know, killed a lot of people and vaccination was much more benign. 
although then as now, vaccination was not popular. And this is a print from 1809 that is in the British Museum. If you squint and look in the bottom right, you can see that it was published by the Yi Anti-Vaccine Society. And what you can see is Dr. Jenner inoculating a rather um, nervous woman from a, a, a pile of pox by, held by a rather unsavory young man. And those who've been inoculated and are now starting to grow various pieces of cow out of them. And you have a rather frightened group of people at the door who are next. So that, um, that people were uh, resistant to vaccines uh, from the get-go. Um, now that turns out to have been the first vaccine, but it was, in advance, it was really about a hundred years ahead of its time. This is a table from the um, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, the US, um, showing that smallpox in 1798, and then towards the end of the 1800s, we had a, quite a few more um, vaccines. And I wanna point out that although smallpox is a virus, many of these diseases are caused by bacteria. And I just point out that bacteria are different from viruses. Viruses are very small. They're really not a life form. They're really more a parasite. They only have five to 10 or 12 genes. And they basically take over your cell machinery to make more viruses. They can't reproduce themselves. Unlike bacteria, like E. coli, which can, they care, you know, E. coli has about 4,000 genes. It can grow in the right culture media. That becomes important because these bacterial diseases can also be treated by antibiotics, but it's not been as easy to find antivirals. And when we do like for AIDS and now hepatitis, they really tend to be much more specific than antibiotic. But this gives you a size comparison of, well, this is a red blood cell, it's relatively small. Most human cells are about twice this size. So viruses are really quite small invaders. Um, I'm going to just point out that this era from the late 1800s through the 1920s and 30s was really the heyday of microbiology. And um, um, there were several popular books, notably Paul de Cruz, The Microbe Hunters, which many microbiologists cite as having inspired them to get into the field uh, because um, it was really an exciting time as people were identifying these agents and creating vaccines and really saving lives. And that's sort of shown in this next table from the CDC, where this is just the US, sort of an annual morbidity for diseases like smallpox, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, and so on. And you can see that in, in an, on an annual basis, you had thousands to tens or hundreds of thousands of cases. But then after the vaccines, these dropped in some cases to zero, but, um, but they're generally um, virtually eradicated. And so much so that even though there, I am told there are maybe several hundred listening, only those my age or older might even have known somebody who's ever had one of these diseases. And I just offer this point in passing that um, it, you know, virtually every medical profession I know is completely bewildered by the current anti-vaccine or any anti-vaccine sentiment because the the data are absolutely clear. And the only way you can understand it really is that the vaccines have been a victim of their own success, that these um, really scourges of humanity are now moving oh, out, of, out of living memory. So um, people, you know, anyway, so what are vaccines? So just like Edward Jenner, basically there's something that elicits, elicits, looks enough like the pathogen to elicit an immune response that's protective. The classic ones have been alive attenuated. So some a virus like a cowpox that is alive, but that is not as potent or inactivated. So you can either kill it with formaldehyde or chemicals or heat it up. And so then the protein is in the virus is still there, but it's not no longer able to infect. And for those of a certain age, um, we just say that the Sabin polio vaccine is a represents a live attenuated and the Salk vaccine is in an activated form. Also common are subunits so that you rather than putting in a whole virus, which has certain 
potential drawbacks. You take a, the key point, key part of it, isolate it, and then you, you, you use that to immunize. Now, this is a modern uh, figure from the San Diego Tribune talking about coronavirus vaccines. So on the flank on the left and the right are two very modern types of vaccines. Um, so, um, and so on the left, you, instead of injecting the protein or the virus, you inject its genetic material. And then your host cell, the person who's vaccinated, then takes up this genetic material and then makes the, a part of the virus that uh, is coded for on it by itself to stimulate the immune response. Now, the advantage of this is it the chemistry and it's easy and quick to design. So you just change the code and you change to the different virus. The other thing over here, and so this is what um, we'll talk about later. This is a type of virus that Moderna and a company called Inovio uh, are producing. You may also have heard of the University of Oxford AstraZeneca virus uh, vaccine. And that turns out to be a weak virus in which they've added in a small piece of the code of the coronavirus so that this T coat protein looks like the coronavirus and will elicit an anti-coronavirus response. Now, so how did coronaviruses get their name? So coronaviruses, it turns out, were actually first discovered in the 1930s um, as a, with a, something that gave chickens a respiratory disease. But in the 1960s in England, they were isolated from humans. And it turns out that about 15% of what we would call the common colds come from some form of a coronavirus. And in fact, before uh, I started this, uh, Mike Mauck asked me, you know, why can't we have a vaccine for the common cold? And it turns out that there are only about, there are about 200 different viruses that cause the common cold. And so, it's a, it's, a, it's a really beyond the game of whack-a-mole at this point to do that, um, to do that effectively, that is. And so, but what these investigators who purified these from people with cold saw under an electron microscope as shown here on the top left, this sort of central blob or core with these spikes protruding around it. And what that reminded them of was the solar corona that you see in an eclipse. And so they gave it the name coronavirus. So that's where it got its name because of these characteristic spikes. And we'll come back to those spikes in a moment. Now, I said that the coronaviruses are known for causing the common cold, not very serious, but uh, typically, but quite inconvenient. But in the last couple of decades, there are two cases where coronaviruses uh, gave rise to very, very serious disease or diseases with serious consequences. The first was in 2002, originating in China, uh, SARS, the first SARS, so SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And there were 8,500 cases before it went away with a case fatality rate of 10%, so about 800 deaths. So uh, if you got SARS, you had a one in 10 chance of not surviving the infection. And then in 2012, there was another coronavirus called MERS, Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome, that was initially found in Saudi Arabia. Um, that proved even more fatal in, the, in that there were 34% of the people who contracted the disease uh, succumbed to the disease. So these um, got, scared a lot of people and led to a lot of um, epidemiology and public health measures that effectively have um, um, corralled the disease. And so even though people have been working on a vaccine for these diseases, there has been no vaccine because there has been no disease. So you could test the vaccine to see if it works. Um, and one of the reasons uh, that is that although both of these coronaviruses probably come from bats, the MERS goes through camels, which is why it emerged in Arabia. And in fact, human to human um, transmission is relatively low. So one way to stop the disease, which is particularly easy in the United States is not to interact too much with camels. Now, this is just a timeline on the left of the original SARS and on the right of the um, new SARS, we call SARS-CoV-2. And the only point is, so these markations are about a month. So you have a first patient, 
You have about three months before uh, the World Health Organization is notified. And then you have about five months before the genetic sequence is available. Um, things are moving really fast with SARS-CoV-2. The first patients were really realized in December. I mean, probably they occurred before, but they weren't appreciated to be a separate new uh, disease. Um, but the genetic sequence was made available on January 10th, less than a month that it was realized that it was actually a coronavirus disease. And then that has set in motion a lot of scientific research, um, some of which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Now, I just wanna repeat here that, so I, so I don't confuse anyone, and I know it can be confusing, but SARS-CoV-2 is referring to the virus and COVID-19 refers to the disease caused by the virus. Um, before I get too started about SARS-CoV-2, just the update from one of the sites I look at way too much uh, corona, to look at coronavirus is just to point out that unlike SARS and MERS, there are just in the United States there are over 4 million cases with over 146,000 deaths, 15,000 cases worldwide with over 630,000 deaths. Now, um, estimates are that these are vastly underestimating. These cases are people or patients who've been identified by um, a test, but it's, um, we'll talk in a moment. It seems a lot of people are asymptomatic so that uh, probably a lot much larger number of the population has actually been inf infected. And so when I was thinking about this talk, I was really thinking some of the questions I had, well, gee, you know, um, what's the time line for this disease. And I looked through a lot of data and one of the best sources is actually a paper published in March from Chinese scientists or doctors um, who analyzed almost 200 Wuhan patients. And this is sort of a timeline showing the days moving from left to right and based basically the various where they had fever, cough, admitted to an ICU, the treatment and whether they were positive for the virus. What they don't show, but is really quite important, is that even by then it was known that um, there is between two to four days after you're infected before the symptoms show up. And that average is about five days. And this becomes key because during this time, post-infection pre-symptom, there's many documented cases of transmission. People feel fine, they don't know they're sick, but they can uh, pass the disease along. And so because now in the US, mostly um, you need to have symptoms to be tested, people are identified usually somewhere here as the cases. And so what that means is that if you, and this is keep in mind an average so that people get better or succumb faster, or there are many cases where people have spent in multiple weeks to months um, in the hospital before recovering or succumbing. But on average, once you're, uh, you have symptoms, you're about a week from hospitalization if you're going to need hospitalization. And then once you're hospitalized, which is about right here, you're about on average, about two weeks away from either recovering or passing away from the disease. The other point is all through this period, you are shedding virus, but in most cases, once your symptoms resolve or you die, um, you are no longer uh, shedding disease. Now, the other thing that was learned from these early studies in China and Korea, this is both data from March, um, uh, is that SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 disproportionately affects the elderly with severe symptoms. And this is just showing age ranges and the, per, and, and the death rate. And this is whoop, Korea and China. Their Korea, the death rate was about half of China, but that's really not the point here. The point here is that they, they and everywhere else in the world has shown that um, this is really uh, a, a disproportionately affects the elderly and affects people with predisposing conditions. People who have heart disease, diabetes, people who are overweight, people who have immunocompromise or, or uh, autoimmune disorders, people who are undergoing cancer therapy and so on. 
so that those people are really at much higher risk than um, younger, more healthy people. Now, so um, this is uh, from the frequently asked questions uh, part about SARS, the first SARS from the CDC website. And I read it because, the, and I've added the yellow highlights, the question, how long is a person with SARS infectious? And it, the answer, persons with SARS are most likely to be contagious only when they have symptoms. And in fact, um, to date, no cases of SARS, SARS-1, remember, have been reported amongst persons who were exposed to a SARS patient before the onset of symptoms. Now, why that's really important is that if you recall, SARS-1 was able to be contained, 8,000 cases. And one of the reasons it was able to be contained is that you weren't infectious to others until you were sick. And by the time you were sick, you were not going out to bars, you were not going to restaurants, you were not going to um, social gatherings or scientific meetings even. And so um, that was one way that it was um, 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 easier to contain. And the other is that then you, that you, could, you knew all, more or less all of the contacts. And um, so um, that was, those are important points. Now, as I mentioned, um, many people are asymptomatic. In other words, they're infected with disease, but don't even know they're infected. And this is different from pre-symptomatic, which means you're infected, don't know, but then you develop the symptoms later. And that was one of my questions that I had going into this is what is this an asymptomatic rate? And the answer is we really don't know. We just know it's significant. And the reason we don't know is we really haven't had the infrastructure to do random testings of the population to see what's out there, who survived that we didn't know, at least not yet. But as of July 10th, the CDC says the best estimate is that 40% of the cases are asymptomatic. So 40% of the people who are infectious or infected and are able to, in many cases, transmit the virus, um, don't know they are even sick. And they put a range of 10% to 70% on this, which is another way of saying, we really don't know, we just know it's there. So that it becomes really important because that makes SARS COVID-2 difficult to control is that people don't know they're sick. They go out and behave normally. They fly on airplanes. You go to scientific meetings. There was a famous scientific meeting uh, in Boston in February that was known as a super spreader event. So, and this is um, one reason that makes this disease much more difficult to maintain is that um, um, you're not, you can transmit it when you're not showing symptoms. Now, I'm going to uh, now move, let's see, escape from this to, yes, to something, to something from the Washington Post. Now this is available to everybody because it's part of their COVID coverage. This actually came out in March 14th, but I think it is, um, it helps illustrate a several key points. And the first one is it seems a bit quaint but at the time in March, there were 2000 cases, remember we're now over 4 million. But what was really alarming at the time was this exponential increase. So you can see that it, around here, it's still you know, in the beginning of March, it's about 70. By two weeks later, it's over 2100. So that means it's gone up about 30 times in about two weeks. And that would mean that if another two weeks, we would be at 60,000, two weeks after that, we'd be at 1.8 million. Or as they said, by May, about 100 million cases. Now, if you then superimpose this curve with what was going on in Italy, now recall at this point in Italy, they were two weeks ahead of us, two weeks ahead of the US. And they had you superimposed exactly on this curve and they went straight up as an exponential. And so that's why people were quite alarmed and it is quite alarming. And that one really um, problem with this disease is that it gets out of hand very fast as we've seen now at least twice in our country. So this is just modeling sort of transmission to give you sort of a view of what happens. So the basic idea is that you'll have, um, let's see if we can start this over, contacts that 
you have a sick person hits an unsick person, they get sick, they hit another person, they transmit. Or what can happen is a sick person gets better, turns purple, and this is how it can transmit. Now, this is just a simulation showing random people bumping around and showing you how people get sick with time. And then what happens is they start to get better and recover or die. And so this is what would happen if there's no intervention whatsoever. You would serve a steep rise and then a steep fall as people get better um, and become infected. Now, uh, this is a case where what if you have an isolated case in say in Wuhan and you quarantine and you keep everybody safe, but you can't actually keep people from traveling and it sneaks out. And eventually what happens is you get this secondary peak as the larger group gets infected. But as time goes, you then have people recover. So how can you slow this down? We all know about social distancing. So what that is effectively doing is it's keeping a bunch of dots from moving around so that the sick dots, when they go out, they don't have as much opportunity to pass along the disease. And so what happens is this, this, this rise, steep rise is slowed, and that allows then people to become uh, immune at a much slower way. And we'll see this is what's called flattening the curve. That's one example, and you can do a more extreme example. For example, this was done in Wuhan where people were really uh, locked down. And that will severely flatten the curve um, because it will prevent transmission. And that sort of just showing you these uh, different scenarios, you do nothing, you get a big exponential peak. If you sort of moderately or extensive distance, what you can do is then blunt that peak. So let me go back to here. Um, let's see where I am. Yes. And so I want to sort of tie a few things together. So what's shown here then is a timeline for the daily new cases in the US and the daily deaths. And showing you this is where we were in March. And about here, uh, this social distancing in most places shut down. And then it's a lagging indicator because remember, your new cases are basically infections that happened a week ago. And so it took a while for this then to slow down, but then it did. And in April, it sort of peaked at uh, daily cases in the mid 30,000s. If you look at deaths and you look at where this peak is, it's sort of about two weeks later, depending upon you draw it, draw it which is sort of what I was showing you before, that um, once you become symptomatic, you will then be hospitalized or pass away with or recover within about two weeks. And so what I want to point out is this is coming up, this is, this is from this morning, so this is coming to the current day. But if you look, starting in mid-June, which was you know, roughly two weeks or so after then you started opening up, is when you start seeing the increases in cases. Now you would expect to see, so about two weeks later, an increase in deaths as well. But if you look here, to the number of cases, it was by the end of June, we we're having a similar number of cases. So you would expect this peak here to be somewhat similar to here. In other words, you expect as many deaths here as here, and that's not the case. So um, that's quite interesting. And um, that is, it appears to be explained, although this there's really not proof, by the fact that the demographic of those infected is now shifting younger. So that younger people who are less affected or, or, or less likely to die um, are now being infected. And so the death rate is decreasing, but we do know that um, um, with time, it will get, every, get, get to other populations as well. The other possible explanation is that physicians are getting better at treating this disease so that now we know certain drugs like remdesivir or dexamethasone can help. And even simple things like putting people on their stomachs can re uh, reduce the pressure on their lungs and aid breathing. But anyway, I just found it interesting that all we have not yet seen, but we are seeing it, starting to see it now, an increase in death 
rate that is um, following the increase in cases. And this is just showing you sort of what I showed you before, this flattening of the curve. And so the, only this is shown with the healthcare system capacity. And the reason that you'd want to flatten the curve is that if you just let it run loose, you will get exponentially large numbers of patients who will overwhelm hospitals, who will create a certain amount of chaos. There will be unnecessary deaths if you had a heart attack or you're in a car accident, you would not have access to a hospital. And so this flattening the curve is what epidemiologists want to do to keep us below the healthcare system capacity. And that buys time to improve treatments and develop vaccines, and also buys time to learn effective public health measures and improve our testing capacity so that we learn, for example, does you know how much social distancing is necessary. Um, and then I just want to add that this sort of propagation you may read about something called the reproductive number or R0, which for COVID has been estimated to be around two or two and a half. And so that mean, what that means is really quite simple. If someone is sick, they will infect two or two, and on average, two or two and a half more people who will then in turn infect two more people and so on, which gives rise to the exponential increases. Now, the goal of uh, all public health measures are to get R0 less than one, because that means eventually, pardon me, the disease will burn itself out if you propagate it to fewer and fewer people over time. And so one way to think about what we're trying to do with social distancing is decreasing this number from two to below one or any other measure that we might take. So how do we do this? So the first point is that the very well established now public health measures we're all aware of. Wear masks, physically distance. We know that the disease primarily is transmitted through uh, uh, droplets, through sneezes, through talking, through coughing and so on. Wash your hands. And then as a population, we need to test, contact trace and isolate those who are exposed. Now I wanted, a make a brief mention about masks because one of the people I spoke to before and said, well, what is the deal with masks? Why are we told not to wear them? And now we are. So this is confusing. And basically the short of it is that the CDC really screwed up. They messed up in March by not advising mask wearing. Uh, at the time, they were concerned that um, if people, the general population used masks, that it would, it would siphon them away from medical care workers who really needed them. Also, I think there just wasn't a lot of data at the time that seemed an extreme measure for something they weren't sure of. Well, the data are now in and there's several different types of it. So this is a particularly illustrative work from um, scientists at the Florida Atlantic University College of Engineering showing what happens if you sneeze without a mask, you see this cloud of droplets that goes out six to nine feet. If you have a mask, a similar sneeze is contained. It's not fully contained, but it is largely contained. Also, the epidemiology is clear. Places that have had mask ordinances have seen drops in transmission. Now, it may be hard to tease it out from other activities, but it's pretty clear if you look at the data, masks prevent transmission. There's also quite a well-known case in Missouri where two hairdressers, who were in symptomatic, they were symptomatic and later shown to have COVID, came to work for four days, but they were required to wear masks and gloves as were their um, patrons. And they are also required to keep track of their patrons. Since the, between the two of them had 139 people that came to the salon, they were contact traced, not a single one of those 139 uh, developed the disease so that the masks and those measures really seem to work in this case. Um, and we can just look at, 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 and this is just point is that public health measures, which are primarily what we have now can work. This is just showing you the number of daily cases in the US and the European Union. So it's possible using public health measures to to stem this tide. Now, 
this is at 40,000. This was about two weeks ago. Unfortunately, in the latest days, it's about 70,000. So it's literally off this chart, again, showing close to exponential increases. That is really, really alarming. And as it goes up, it gets harder and harder to contain. Um, so there are a lot of examples out there, New Zealand, China, South Korea, Japan, you know, they're not perfect. Well, maybe New Zealand is, they're down to zero, but they're looking at small numbers of hundreds of cases per day, not tens of thousands. So these measures work. Another way to get R0 down is what's called herd immunity. This is something that's well known to epidemiologists. It's really quite simple although I've had a lot of questions about it. Um, so what it is if you have a red infected person, they will infect a certain number of people through their transmission. Um, and if there's no herd immunity, everybody they encounter gets an, or a large number of people they encounter get infected. If there are a number of green people who've had the disease or who are immune, then the random bumping will be much less likely to to propagate the disease, so R0 will be small. So this is what's known as herd immunity, so that if enough people have the disease, then R0, the, the transmission rate, goes low and the disease burns itself out. Now, uh, this is a well-studied phenomenon. According to scientists at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, we would need about 70% of the population to have sufficient herd immunity to really drop, the, drop this rate. So 70% of the population is a little over 200 million people. Remember we're at 4 million now. If that even means 40 million because there may be 10 times as many people who just didn't get tested, that still would be five times the number of people infected and likely five times the number of deaths that we have now. So that I think that um, even the governor of Mississippi, who was not a friend of wearing masks, has tweeted, he says, I'm a numbers guy. Herd immunity just does not make sense. I mean, it's something that happens. And we know this in a way just from um, some um, recent news, which is that the herd immunity, the immunization rate for measles is about 90% in the US generally, but there are pockets where it's dropped below that. And we've now begun to, to probably 70 to 80%, and we've now begun to see localized outbreaks of measles in those cases. The point is that herd immunity is a thing, but when you look at the numbers, it makes no sense that that's a way to get ourselves out of this uh, current um, pandemic. Number two, get a vaccine so that you can then make a number of people who are immune and then stop the transmission. Now I get to be a little bit of a hometowner here and talk about a uh, vaccine uh, with UT connections. And in fact, one of our panelists is the smiling gentleman on the left here, Jason McClellan, associate professor at, um, at UT Austin, the Department of Molecular Biosciences. And I actually encourage you to go look at this uh, lovely article, COVID-19 vaccine candidate with UT ties arrived quickly after years in the making. So Jason and his colleagues have been working on vaccines for SARS and MERS. And so when the SARS-2, COVID-2 came along, they knew exactly what to do, which I like to use as a bit of an advertisement for basic science research. Now, this story actually starts at the NIH with respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Now, parents may know RSV because they're it's, not, it's, not, it's quite common in, in, in children younger than five years of age. It's not often fatal in the US because of the hospitalization care. But outside of the US, it's a killer of, of one or 200,000 children per year. But inside the US, it's responsible for about 14,000 deaths. Now, RSV, people have been working very hard for about 50 years to try to find a vaccine or to try to develop a vaccine. So far, they've not succeeded. Jason and his colleagues, when he was at NIH, Peter Kwong and Barney Graham, began to take a bit of a different or new approach, which is called structure-based vaccine design. So this is the RSV uh, vaccine. It should be very familiar to those who've seen the similar pictures of the coronavirus. 
which has these spike proteins on the surface. Now these spike proteins are important because they help the virus attach to the host cell, but then they split open like a, a, a um, switchblade and they uh, then cut into the host cell and allow the virus to inject its genetic material into the host cell and begin an infection. So what Jason did is he used uh, very sophisticated techniques to study the atomic structure of these spike proteins in this pre-fusion state and then in this post-fusion state. Now, the reason that that is important is that this is before it's infected, this is after it's infected. The immune system recognizes the shapes of proteins. If it sees this shape, it'll make antibodies to this shape, but they won't protect because it's too late. So what are called neutralizing antibodies, antibodies that neutralize the virus infection actually tend to be to this conformation. So what Jason and his colleagues then did was they did the molecular equivalent of putting spot welds into this, um, this spike protein. Um, and so that it would stabilize it because of one of the problems and one of the reasons is thought the vaccines didn't work is if this would be unstable, if you inject it into people, it flips open into this conformation, which is really not protective. And they, so they put these molecular spot welds, stabilize this prefusion form that is before infection, and then use that as vaccine. And this is two science papers. So science is a very high prestige journal. One from 2013, showing that this stabilized spike protein gave a tenfold better immune response when injected into mice. And then about a year ago, 2019, this is shown in a phase one clinical trial that it actually generated a good immune response in humans. Now, the point is this is demonstration of principle, but that it took six years to go from the preclinical, from the vaccine to even just getting through the first phase of vaccine trials. And then Jason, once he'd had success with RSV, moved to, to the coronavirus and showed that the same thing happens. This is a cartoon showing a pre-fusion coronavirus spike splitting open. He and his college then used their knowledge from the RSV example to stabilize MERS and SARS. And then once the SARS-2 uh, CoV-2 sequence came out in January 10, they were able to immediately take their knowledge from SARS-1, make a stabilized spike protein. And this is just showing Jason here using our new uh, multi-million dollar cryo electron microscope that allowed us to help recruit him from Dartmouth to solve the structure of these spike proteins. And I wanna give a great shout out to Judy, Judith and Henry Sauer who, and, and CPRIT who provided, and UT for providing funding for this instrument, which has enabled Jason's work to look at the SARS uh, spike protein structures and help design new proteins. Now, uh, this has got real world applications, both Moderna and Novavax. These are companies in the race to make vaccines against COVID have used the stabilized spike protein or licensed the stabilized spike protein that Jason and his colleagues at NIH co-developed. Now, I just on the home stretch here, just talk a little bit about clinical trials um, and how they let us know that a new drug, or in this case, a vaccine is both safe and it works. So these are well designed, well sort of laid out in, in, in law. There's a phase one trial, which is small. Um, in, it's really just asking, is it safe? Let's just give this to normal volunteers and make sure it, it's safe. If it's safe, then you move up to a phase two trial, which and I've shown here the number of people in the Moderna trials of the Moderna vaccine that you may have heard about. Um, there's 600 people in this trial. And here you're looking at a continued safety because maybe there's a rare side effect, but also what dose is good. And also maybe to look at different age groups, maybe you need a different dose in different age groups and so on. Based on this results, if it's proved safe and there's evidence that it's working, you move to a large phase three trial. In this case for Moderna, there's gonna be 30,000 uh, people involved. Now that phase three, you have a placebo arm. So 15,000 get the, get the vaccine, 15,000 get a saline solution. And you'll only know if the virus really works if 
when you begin to look at people who got the vaccine, and these are double blinded, so the patients don't know, or the people who give it don't know, um, if the people that get the vaccine are actually protected relative to those that don't. So in an odd way, the fact that we have a resurgence of the coronavirus in specific hotspots may help these trials. Because for example, if you were to do this trial in New Zealand where there is no virus, the placebo arm wouldn't show any, any, any disease and you would never know if the virus was really saving, working or not. But here, um, I see that the trial sites, including two in Austin, have localized or been picked for places where there's a lot of active virus. So hopefully we can see an answer soon. Then what happens? Let's say you see that the virus arm, the vaccine arm is protecting, then you, the FDA has to agree with you and approve it. The government is helping in Operation Warp Speed by picking four or five vaccines that look promising, including the Moderna um, and Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, uh, among others, investing billions of dollars to stockpile large amounts of these vaccines in the event they work, so that once they work, there won't be any delay or be less of a delay gearing up to make the literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of um, doses that will be needed to protect the population. Um, this is just showing you that we have a lot of shots on goal, that there are now over 140 uh, different vaccines. Whoops, sorry. Uh, four of them, including Moderna um, and AstraZeneca and I uh, believe and others are in phase three. This one approval is a Chinese vaccine that um, we don't know a lot about, but has um, been um, conditionally approved in China for, um, I believe uh, they're, in, they're immunizing their um, military personnel. Um, this week has brought a lot of news. Uh, the Moderna vaccine, the phase one trial results were published in New England Journal. The AstraZeneca Oxford was published in a journal called The Lancet about a week later. And then uh, the Pfizer BioNTech was also published earlier this week on Monday. All of these report phase one trials, all of them look good and they look good in two ways. One is they're generating neutralizing antibodies, all of them. And the other is, there, doesn't, there do not seem to be any large safety concerns. Now that said, most people do have some side effect. They have a sore arm, they have fatigue, they maybe have a mild headache or a mild fever. Um, so it's, they're not completely benign, but that may be in part and parcel what the injection is doing is to stimulate its immune response. So, um, so far so good. The big question, when will we have a vaccine? As I just noted, uh, um, I'll talk about the Moderna vaccine. Phase one is finished. Phase two, 600 enrollment is complete. Phase three, the 15,000, 15,000 starts next Monday or is supposed to start next Monday. How long will it take? Well, we can make a little, some guesses. So anecdotal reports suggest that it has not been hard to enroll volunteers. So that's moving fast. One point is these, vaccines typically have a shot on day one and then a booster shot uh, four weeks later. And then the immunity really is strongest, is really peaking about two weeks after that. So it takes about six weeks once you've enrolled someone and given their first shot to really sort of have a confidence that if they're going to be immune, they will be. Now, once these people are enrolled, it's just a matter of how fast you can enroll them. There are 87 sites. If they can do 10 a day, or a little more than 10 a day at all of them, then it would take about 30 days to enroll everybody. That's just, I have no idea. That's just a wild ass guess, sorry. Um, and so, but we'll, then how long will it take? Well, it'll depend. Do the vaccines work? If they work and there are sufficient people in the placebo groups who are getting COVID, then it could be quite soon. And I would say the earliest would be just based on my guesses, mid-October or so. And I'll point out that, as I said, there are four vaccines in phase three trials 
And I think if one of them works, then we're hopeful that multiple of them will work. So keep your uh, eyes peeled for the news and ears peeled, but uh, hopefully by mid-October or, or November, we'll have some indication whether these uh, vaccines are gonna work. So until then, uh, wear masks when you're around others, not your family group, especially indoors. Avoid crowds, wash your hands, and I'll stop and let the panel take questions. So thank you all for your attention. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dan, that was great. Uh, I knew it would be. So uh, what's gonna happen next now is that Dan's gonna introduce his uh, three panelists. Ah, yes. And then uh, you'll be typing in your questions into the chat part of the of, of YouTube, and then I and the panelists will be picking them, and the panelists will be giving you their brilliant answers. And so, uh, go for it, Dan. All right. Well, um, we have Jason McClellan, whose work I mentioned, who's intimately involved in the vaccine development for the last uh, ten or fifteen years. Uh, we have Shelley Payne, uh, who's been working on. Um, Micro, microbiology for, um, for her, length, her very illustrious career. She works on Shigella, Salmonella, digestive uh, things, or uh, digestive pathogens. So what makes certain bacteria pathogenic and others not? And then Klaus Rilke, who's the chairman of Integrative Biology. We actually have a lot of chairs today. So it's, you're being uh, um, lectured by furniture, I guess. But Klaus has interesting background. He trained as a theoretical physicist and then he's applied this um, analytical tools to many problems in, bio in biology, including evolution of viruses. And so he's also been a very um, important voice at UT for appropriate and safe measures. And he's been staying on top of a lot of what we know about coronavirus. And so I'm really happy to have all three. So Mike, Back to you. Fantastic. Okay, so Dan, if you could stop your screen share. Okay. Uh, Very good. Then we'll be uh, starting to field questions and. Okay. Fantastic. So uh, I guess I'll jump on the first one, which was the very first question. There's, there's a question about the blood brain barrier and the, the questioner, there you go. Sorry. The questioner points out that things like brain injury and cancer can weaken the blood brain barrier. And they're wondering if that has any effect on susceptibility to uh, COVID-19. Well, if nobody's speaking, I'll take a wild guess and say, we really don't know, but it probably does. There are certainly anecdotal reports of neurological symptoms that are not widespread. So there may be predisposition, predisposing conditions. Um, the receptor for the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, is on um, the cells that line blood vessels so that it does get to a lot of organs. Um, and I'm not sure about the, specifically the blood brain barrier, but it does get to the endothelium. And so that's why there are a lot of reports of many organ being affected by this disease. Okay, so next question uh, that looks interesting is that uh, it's about holding immunity. The questioner points out that they've heard that uh, those who have had COVID don't hold their immunity. And uh, uh, the question is, is this the case and how could it affect a, a vaccine effectiveness? Oh, I can jump in here. Yeah, the, the, the data people are, are showing, it's basically showing that the human immune system is working properly. We are supposed to raise an antibody response uh, due to primary infection, those titers should wane over time. We can't have all of our antibodies be at maximal levels uh, for every single pathogen we've ever encountered. So there should be an initial bolus of antibodies due to plasma blast. Those will then wane. Uh, one of the things people don't appreciate is that uh, the plasma blast become long-lived plasma cells. We're also generating memory B and memory T cells such that upon re-exposure uh, to the pathogen, all those cells can rapidly begin proliferating, generating antibodies and fighting off the second infection. So just looking at antibody titers in the sera alone uh, 
tells a very incomplete picture. I'll jump into your question. I may have been referring to an April report from Korea that about 200 people had uh, tested negative and then tested repositive. And I just note that in May, the, the Korean CDC followed up with contact tracing and determined that those were essentially false positives. So that at least to date, there is not a lot of evidence, although some anecdotal evidence for individuals, but in the case of 15 million worldwide infections, there's not a lot of evidence for immediate reinfection. Now, whether people will be susceptible in a year or two, we don't know. We're not that far out. Okay, how about this one? Um, uh -oh, so the question is, are the four vaccines in phase three using all different methods or, or are all the uh, using similar methods? Jason? I don't think, are there four in phase three? Well, that's according to the New York Times tracker, but I think probably at least the Oxford one, the Moderna one. The Oxford one. phase three in Brazil, that's using a adenoviral, a chimp ad adenovirus. That was um, the far right on the, the slide I showed of the virus types. Yeah, Moderna is using mRNA, Inova is using DNA, Novavax is using the protein subunit. So, there's a, a, a smorgasbord of, I don't know about the ones in phase three, but there's a smorgasbord of many, di you know, many different modalities that are being done by multiple companies. So um, all five of those on the slide had multiple companies pursuing similar types of things. But I think the ones that were in phase three are all different as Jason indicated. Okay, here's one from Amy. Uh, she wants to know how can high schools open safely when social distancing is needed to not contract the virus? I can try to answer that. It's very simple. Thanks, Klaus. They can't. <laughs> they can't. Um, the, the, that's uh, the only, I think the only safe way to open schools really is to bring the prevalence in the population down to a level that essentially nobody is infected or like you have occasion, maybe like in Germany now they have a few infections here and there and you can keep them uh, at bay. You can contact trace the moment somebody gets infected. But if you have to assume that if you have a hundred children and three of them are infected, that, that would be like a 3% prevalence in a population, right? Mm -hmm. At that point, you really can't safely open the schools. And the, the argument, oh, children don't get that sick, that argument doesn't carry very far because if they infect the other children and then the children infect the teachers or the children go home and infect their parents or infect their grandparents, then, I mean, yeah, the children themselves maybe will not end up in the hospital, will not die, but their parents, grandparents, teachers will. And so it's just, there's no good way to open schools, in my opinion. And I see Shelley nodding. Do you want to well, add? Yeah, and I think uh, Sharda Joji in astronomy published an interesting editorial in that was in the New York Times about the, the one way that might work is to set up schools and places like the Irwin Center of events facilities as uh, kind of safe zones for students to do online learning. And you would have them physically distanced, spread them out, and but they would be doing things online. Uh, but Klaus is absolutely right. The children may not show severe symptoms but they're going to take the infections home, infect parents, grandparents. And that's been shown with flu epidemics over and over that they become foci for infections and spread to the community. And I would say it's, it's not a non-zero probability that a child dies. There is a nine-year-old who yeah. died in Florida from COVID today with no underlying symptoms that people are aware of. So here's a question about different strains. The questioner mentions that uh, they've heard that there are already multiple strains and wants to know how this would affect uh, the effectiveness of a, a vaccine. 
yeah, strains may not be the, the proper terminology for it. The, the virus is accumulating one or two changes per month at the nucleotide level. Um, the spike protein may be generating one amino acid change per month and just in different viruses. Uh, so we're not, it's not a very fast rate. We're not particularly concerned that a vaccine made against like the initial Wuhan strain would be uh, less effective against any current circulating isolate. Yeah, it's, it's too early to really even know what may happen, but I think a worst case scenario there would be something like the situation with influenza, where on a somewhat regular basis, you would have to update the vaccine. But if you have a working pipeline to generate a vaccine like we have with influenza, there's really no big problem with updating it if the virus slowly accumulates mutations. And worst case scenario, you would have to take a vaccine maybe once a year or so, but it's probably going to be even slower than influenza. So probably you wouldn't have to need a new vaccine every year. Yeah, I think much slower than influenza. I would say maybe every three to five years. Hmm. Okay. So here's a question about the safety of vaccines. Uh, the question is, is it true that certain companies use heavy metals in the vaccine that are potentially dangerous? Not that I'm aware of. Not anymore. At one point there was mercury, but those have, that's been removed for, for, for decades. Okay, this, this is one that came up at my, at my dinner table the other night. Uh, there are reports that different blood types uh, can produce different susceptibility. And the question here is the type A blood type is more susceptible. Does anybody know anything about that? I've only seen it in the popular press, but I haven't seen the primary literature behind it. Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping O positive is particularly not susceptible, but you know, uh, just asking. No, the question raises a good point is that why do we such see such variability in severity of disease? And that's really, that going to be an interesting thing to figure out with time. And O group is associated with susceptibility in other epidemics such as cholera. So there, there is a precedent for that. But again, like Jason, I haven't seen any, any data on this for COVID. All right, folks, roll up your sleeves. We're going to get serious now. Here's a question. If high schools cannot open safely, why is UT reopening, at least partially? The trust the students mentality doesn't work as we saw this spring with spring breakers heading out of the country and such. So for Go job on. security, I'll let Dan answer this one. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I um, all I can say is I look at this that you have to plan for reopening and dial back if circumstances require it at the because you can't go the other way. You can't decide to open up and do it safely in the middle of August. So I think people are planning. I hope they're also keeping a very careful eye on what's going on in the community, which is obviously going to affect the risk level moving forward. So here's a question that I'll answer. How long will these slides be posted on the YouTube Brainstorm site? So this is being recorded. And so when we're done, you'll be able to watch the whole thing over again as you roll on. Oh, no. <laughs> There's a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how similar are the different coronaviruses, one from the other? Jason, that's probably your bailiff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess it depends on, on uh, what is meant by similarity. Well, I would go genetic similarity, SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS. Yeah, they're quite distinct. There, there's four different uh, genera within the, the beta coronavirus genus. There's four different lineages, um, really quite distinct. They have different numbers of genes. There's a core set of genes that they all have that are necessary. And then they shuffle other genes in and out. Uh, they have very large genomes, the largest RNA genomes in the viral world. So it allows for quite a bit of plasticity and shuffling, which is one reason that they're able to jump species uh, fairly easily. But uh, let me let me jump in there. Let me say, okay. as, as an outsider, Jason was working on SARS and MERS, and within two to three months, he could figure out a lot about SARS-CoV-2 based on what he had learned about SARS and MERS. This is correct. 
right? Well, yeah, in particular, because we're focused on the spike and the spike protein is structurally conserved. Uh, at the amino acid level, there's only 30, 30, 35% sequence identity between the spikes. So it's quite low from a structure, which is why if you get infected with uh, MERS, you're not protected against SARS-CoV-2. So uh, here's a question about uh, COVID-19 and asymptomatic uh, issues. So if it's asymptomatic and a large percentage of those infected, are current measures like taking individuals' temperature to enter buildings and such effective? It's effective when they find someone with a temperature. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's like the fifth most common side effect or symptom of, of COVID-19. It's a very leaky sieve. It's effective, as Jason said, in some respects, but it's not at all, it's not, you can't rely on it. I'm very skeptical of the temperature measurements because it, to me, it sounds, it, it's sort of, you signal that you're doing something, but you're not achieving much. If you test for temperature in addition to masks, sure, you have one additional step, but if you're just measuring temperature and you're not enforcing masks, then it's pointless. And if you're only enforcing masks and not testing for temperature, you're probably getting about 90% of what you'd be getting if you're testing for temperature. That, that's my personal opinion. Okay. Uh, Jason, this is a question about your approach. The questioner uh, wants to know, you were working on the uh, the prefusion spike for RSV, and why did you choose that approach? And why is looking at the prefusion spike a good approach for uh, SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, that's a great question. So for it's a complicated question for RSV, the the equivalent to the spike protein. Uh, uh, when humans are infected, it's called the F protein. When humans are infected with RSV we make our predominant antibody response against specifically the prefusion confirmation. Most of our very potent neutralizing antibodies are against the prefusion state and not against the postfusion state because when the protein refolds, many of those antibody binding sites are in completely different confirmations. So for RSV, it was, it was very clear. And when we, when we immunize with prefusion versus postfusion, the antibody titers elicited by the vaccination were 10 times higher with prefusion for postfusion. For coronavirus, it's actually a lot more subtle because the primary immune response in humans is against the S1 subunit, which doesn't really have a pre or post confirmation. And so a lot of the antibodies are against the receptor binding domain. That's present in pre and post because that mostly refers to the S2 subunit of the spike. Uh, and there's not, we really haven't found very many antibodies against S2. Um, so another question maybe would be, uh, is spike a better vaccine antigen versus just using the RVD, which some groups are using like BioNTech, Pfizer. Uh, we think it is because there are many more antibody binding sites, many more epitopes on the spike than just the RVD. And so there'd be some concern, I think, that if you use just the RVD as your vaccine immunogen, you could have a few. Uh, let, let me jump in here, Jason. Oh, okay. RVD stands for receptor binding domain. It's a small piece of the spike that is actually binds to the receptor. So um, what's just talking about is using the whole spike, which is maybe 600 and the weighs 600 pounds and the RBD is with about 30 pounds equivalent. Yeah, exactly. So there's some yeah. concern using a very small portion of the spike to focus your entire vaccine response such that if the virus did accumulate one or two changes, one or two mutations in the RBD, it could render the vaccine suboptimal. So we, we think spike is using the full spike is better because of the variety of epitopes. So uh, here's a question uh, about the healthcare system. The questioner wants to know how the healthcare system and the pharmaceutical system need to be reformed uh, given what we've learned from the pandemic. One thing we can do is look at other countries and how theirs have functioned better than ours. Thanks, Shelley, for a, a short and accurate answer. Well, I'd also add, regardless of the mechanisms of how you want to do it, you need 
a healthcare system that covers everybody in some mm -hmm. form. There's many different ways in which it can be done. It can be a entirely public, can be a public, private combination, however you want to do it, but you cannot have 20, 30% of the population not be insured. That's just a disaster for public health. And it's also bad for the people that do have health insurance. Okay, so here's a provocative one. So it, the question is, it's alarming that the virus is capable of jumping from species to species and then being able to proliferate so fast through humans. Rumors say this was a designed virus because of this. Jason, I think you've thought most about this. Yeah, uh, there are viruses in the wild that have been identified in bats and in pangolins that are highly similar to SARS-CoV-2. Not exactly, like 96% identical. Uh, I think it's unlikely that it escaped from a laboratory or at least specifically was engineered to cause some sort of pandemic. Uh, the ways that you would need to um, make a, a virus involves a reverse genetic system uh, that has signatures. This, this has no such signatures that it was created from a reverse genetic system. Uh, so it, it seems like a, a recombination of maybe a bat in a, a pangolin coronavirus. I would also like to add that this is just what viruses do and almost any virus that we are aware of that can cause severe illness and death comes from animals. Um, HIV came from SIV, from, from monkeys. Um, Ebola, we don't actually know exactly where it comes from, but it definitely, it doesn't, uh, the host is not humans. In, in oh, the reservoir is bats for Ebola. Do we know that for sure now? Yeah. Yeah, then you have, you have uh, various like Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, things like that, that, that live in rodents and they cross over. You have rabies, which normally doesn't affect us, but if we get infected by rabies, we die. Um, just influenza it comes from, from birds. It's just what viruses do. They cross over and uh, it happens all the time and it's going to continue to happen. Yeah, I think one of the differences with SARS-CoV-2 is the fact that it was able to spread well person to person. And that uh, has caused it to be able to take hold. But Klaus is absolutely right. You know, throughout history, you can see many, many accounts of viral and bacterial diseases in animals. And it's where people come into close contact with animals. And then these things keep happening. And sometimes that variant that jumps is able to then take hold in a new population. Okay, so uh, we just have time for a few more questions. So the, there's a question about uh, treatments. So uh, I don't wanna try to pronounce the all, all these things, but what can you guys comment on about the, the alternative, which is uh, uh, strategies for treating people who are sick rather than developing vaccines or in addition to it? Jason, maybe you could talk about antibody therapies. Yeah, but that's not really what I think, I mean, what, what people are using in hospitals. Hydroxychloroquine is not being used. That there continues to be studies showing that it's uh, ineffective. I think remdesivir looks promising. Um, and, and that's continuing in, in large phase three clinical trials. And some of the early data looks good on that. As do steroid like dexamethasone is used when um, you're in the sort of cytokine storm to, you know, ironically tamp down the immune system, which you want to get rid of the virus, but then gets out of control. So that is, I think, clearly showing benefit in controlled studies. There's a, there's a question a while back about the virus traveling nine feet and getting into AC ducts and uh, coming back around to that. So uh, what, can you, what can you say about uh, the dangers of being indoors and, uh, in close proximity and bad, bad ventilation and things like that? So from my understanding, it's thought that the major route of transmission is via droplets. And droplets can only travel a certain amount. 
six feet, nine feet. To get up into the air ducts, it would have to be aerosolized, and that's not thought to be a, a major mode of transmission, which is masks wouldn't really protect against aerosolized virus. They would protect against droplets, as Dan showed in the sneeze. It helps pre pre prevent the small droplets containing virus from emerging. So I don't think there's too much of a concern about the aerosol transmission going through ducts and things like that. Yeah, I think the one uh, outbreak in a restaurant that was kind of traced to the air conditioning system was the, f the fact that the direction the air was blowing was carrying the droplets from the table where the people were infected to neighboring tables. And so it wasn't that it was recirculating, but just being blown um, to, the, to the people sitting nearby. That's why even being outside at less than six feet, you're, you're not magically protected just from being outside. And I think people, some of the beach parties have shown that. Yeah. So why are these viruses so dangerous? What, what makes them so virulent and, and uh, da dangerous to humans? Another great topic for study, but um, what I was trying to convey is that this is almost designed by a Dr. Evil to sort of take advantage of human weaknesses in terms of being sort of dangerous, but not kind of dangerous by allowing you to be sick and transmitting, transmitting before you're symptomatic. Um, but in terms of the specific question of what makes this more infective or less infective, Jason shows that this SARS binds a little more tightly to the receptor than SARS-1, but whether that's part of it or it is really not known. It's probably related to the many other genes, some of which we don't even know the functions that are involved in modulating our immune response. Um, you know, coronaviruses span the whole gamut from the seasonal cold, uh, which is very low mortality rates to something like MERS where 35% of infected people die. So there, there's really uh, quite a range and this might be somewhat of a sweet spot where it's not uh, too fatal, where people die right away, uh, but it's still transmissible. But I'd also say there's just this general effect that whenever a population encounters a virus that is new, then the virus is more dangerous just because there's no pre-existing uh, immunity. And so in a way, the um, zoonotic viruses are not different from from human viruses if you have a population that has been isolated that have never seen measles and then you have people coming in and bringing measles in then the measles are much worse for that population than for the, the people where measles has been around and everybody has been exposed to it so that's just also an element of prior exposure Okay, so there's lots of good questions coming in and we're not going to have time for them. So I want to remind everybody to email me uh, if you uh, didn't get your question uh, answered. Let, let's, end, uh, let's end with a question about children. So the question is, how does MIS-C occur in children as a result of COVID-19? I'm not familiar with that abbreviation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know what MIS-C is, so I was, so. Trying to blank here. Uh, I just Googled it, multi-system <laughs> inflammatory syndrome in children. Oh, that. <laughs> uh, I don't think we know, well, what we have figured out over time, it generally is that uh, coronavirus is more an inflammatory um, disease of the blood vessels, maybe even then a respiratory disease. And even in adults, like people develop problems with blood clotting and so on. And so that just seems to be one of the things that the virus does. It, it causes inflammation in particular in blood vessels. Yeah. Okay, folks, so uh, we should probably stop. And uh, I want to thank Dan and Shelly and Klaus and Jason uh, for, for doing this. Uh, I, I, I had a blast. I hope everybody else did. So thank you. Uh, just imagine we're all clapping loudly and uh, happily. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to end one more time. Send your emails to me, mock at utexas.edu if you have more questions. And then 
I want to uh, share my screen quickly to show you uh, uh, the next brainstorms, which is um, Dr. Kristen Patterson, who's a, prof uh, a, a professor of instruction at UT. And uh, she is uh, also works for TIDES, which is a, 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 a entity at UT that helps us uh, teach better. And so she, she's going to uh, talk about uh, the challenges and strategies for uh, teaching when we're having to do it like this uh, over uh, uh, electronically over our computers. And so Kristen's fantastic. Uh, she'll be every bit as good as Dan was tonight. And so I would encourage you to spread, spread the word and, and uh, uh, come see us uh, in, in this same format. On, uh, August 27th. So uh, with that, uh, Dan, thanks again. Shelly, Klaus, Jason, keep up the good work. Thank, thank you. And uh, we may have to change the name to, to UT Molecular Storm or something. I don't know. You guys did such a great job. Uh, and we'll just have to do this again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And thank your audience. Yep. OK. So to the audience, thanks again, and we'll see you next time, hopefully. Bye-bye.